Movie Bob specialist Phil and John are back with another episode of our top 100 movies of all time. We are on episode number 24 this week, almost a quarter of the way through this entire process. We will be there next week. And today we're talking about two gangster movies. We're talking about bloody, violent, gory movies. Although The Godfather Part 2 is actually not that violent. We're talking The Godfather Part 2 from 1974 and Eastern Promises from 2007. The two very overly crowded years in film history and Eastern Promise has definitely got more missed than uh, some other movies from 2007 just because it came out in a year when there was another kind of, I don't know, not gangster, but whatever movie with No Country for Old Men. Um, and then another great acting performance, one of the best of all time from Daniel Day-Lewis and There Will Be Blood, mm-hmm. kind of left Eastern Promises and poor Viggo Mortensen uh, out to dry, which really wasn't their fault. Just kind of bad timing. Uh, David Cronenberg did that movie, though, and it is John's number 77. Um, Godfather Part 2, I'm sure most people have heard of. But somehow, some way, the man that I let come on my podcast had never seen it before. So, John, what were you doing with your life as you waited to watch The Godfather Part 2? It always, it's, a, it's a three and a half hour movie. It's a very daunting movie to get into. Hmm. And it was just... I always kind of just had it sitting there as a, I should watch this. I know I should watch this. And I just never got around to it. And then we started this project and it was on your list. So I was like, I guess I should just wait until then to watch it. And you did. Yeah, I did. And you did. Well, we'll hear John's thoughts on that movie later. We're definitely doing Eastern Promises first tonight, John. Uh, No offense to Eastern Promises or anybody involved in it, but The Godfather Part 2 is the bigger movie of these two. And, uh, you know, Eastern Promises, to me, is one of those movies I only remembered the good parts uh, coming Mm -hmm. into it this time. And I ended up giving it three stars, uh, closer to three and a half than two and a half. That's for sure. So Mm -hmm. I ended up giving it three. But I feel like my expectations were actually too high because the moments I remembered were the the violent opening. I remembered uh, the obviously the bathhouse scene is absolutely iconic. That's as good as it uh, that's as good as it gets. Mm -hmm. And then I remembered I kind of remembered the ending. And that was really all I remembered from this movie. And I actually think it hurt my viewing experience because Mm – I was watching this movie and I had forgotten how much of it is story and I love Mm -hmm. story, but I was kind of going into it with a different expectation. Still really enjoyed it, but I almost feel like I got to watch it again now with the expectation of this is more of a story than, than like a violent movie because my 15 year old brain that watched this the first time remembers it being very over the top. And really other than a few scenes, it's not that over the top. No, it's, Quite subtle in what it's doing with the the gangster aspect of it, and, and quite similar to the Godfather Part Two and its portrayal of gangsters that way, where you remember the violent scene in gangsters movies mm-hmm. all the time because those are, as we said, like those are the iconic scenes. The bathhouse scene in Eastern Promises is a phenomenal sequence of film, mm-hmm. and it's what sticks with you. And when you're thinking of gangsters, you're always thinking about this, the violence and everything Mm -hmm. like that, which is really interesting coming off of a generation who grew up with like the Sopranos, Mm -hmm. where it was so much more focused on story than the violence of gangsters. But when we think of gangster movies, for some reason, we're still thinking about the violence in them. And it, it, it can throw off your expectations when you go see a movie like Eastern Promises. Yeah, and I think both Godfathers are very similar. Obviously, in The Godfather Part 1, which if you haven't watched The Godfather Part 1, don't listen to this podcast. And I feel like this is going to be an episode where we're actually going to talk about both movies kind of simultaneously mm-hmm. a little bit more than we do in the past because they are so similar. And you can see that Cronenberg was obviously very heavily inspired by The Godfather, being that this is all about the family and the son who he can't handle and blah, blah, blah. But... um. But both Godfathers, you remember the sunny scene from The Godfather Part 1. You remember Fredo getting killed in The Godfather Part 2. Spoilers. Like I said, you should have gotten out. (laughs) You remember all of these big moments. You remember Mo Green getting shot through the eye. You remember the baptism by fire everywhere else. But what you forget is how does The Godfather die? The Godfather dies eating oranges and has a heart attack chasing his grandson. And Eastern Promises follows this a lot 
while there's a lot of graphic violence in this movie, the setup to this movie is more like Drive from Nicholas Mining Refn. For anybody who hasn't seen that, I believe we're going to be talking about that at some point as a uh, as like an honorable mention movie. But it's much more like that. It's much more like The Godfather than some of these other like Gangster Squad or whatever, like where it's just going to be like us or even like Inglorious Bastards, which isn't necessarily a gangster movie, but it's very violent and it's very much like depicting an era. And I feel like Eastern Promises does a really good job of balancing all of this and sucking you into the story um, and then hitting you with some of these moments where you're like, ooh, that's brutal. But pretty much this is an hour and 40 minute movie, an hour and 25 minutes of it is very subdued. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think a lot of that comes down to this fact that Cronenberg was really playing up this family aspect of the uh, Russian mafia in this movie mm -hmm. and the importance of that. And to build that, you kind of needed it starkly contrasted with those violent moments, mm -hmm. but you couldn't have violence throughout the entire film. If you're still trying to pound home this idea that family is incredibly important. Yeah. Yeah, there had to be something um there had to be something to keep us invested in everybody. And like the the twist of Vigo being a a um uh what do you call it, like an informer for the police. Uh, yeah. Like that works, but it only works because it does take its time getting there. Like if he's going around killing people like crazy, then it doesn't work. But really what's what's so incredible about his performance in this movie is that he doesn't really do much at all. Most of his performance is just being there and his presence. And, and, you know, that's one of the hardest things to do in acting is to have that type of stage presence that can make people fearful of you without doing anything. And now he's looking out for um, – Vincent Cassell, whose name I forget in the movie, but he's looking out for him and he's trying to help him. But in reality, he's just trying to get closer to the father so he can take them all down. I think it's a really interesting depiction of how all of this is going, uh, of how all this is being done. And, and to show the family, obviously, it's funny to look at The Godfather and we see Michael Corleone and we still root for Michael Corleone probably until the end of The Godfather Part Two. But we root for the Corleone family. In Eastern Promises, you're never rooting for that family but they're both killing people. We're just not seeing as much of the human side of all of them. We're really only seeing Vincent Cassell's human side. And then we're seeing Vigo's kind of perspective on them. And while we think Vigo is a, a part of them, he's being nice to Naomi Watts. So we feel like, oh, we should kind of like what's going on here. When in reality, it has nothing to do with him being nice to Naomi Watts. He really is trying to save her and protect her because he's an informer and he's trying to keep it so that she doesn't get killed or get into something she shouldn't get into. Well, and that's one of the most interesting things about the direction Cronenberg decided to take with this film is most of the time when we're dealing with a gangster movie, we're so rooted into the gang itself. Mm -hmm. And we're looking at like either we know that someone is an undercover cop working in the gang trying to figure out mm -hmm. information and we're seeing that gangster life or we're seeing someone being brought into the gang or we're following the mob leader. But in Eastern Promises we're viewing it all from an outside perspective. Yeah. Because the entire movie is in uh, Naomi Watts' Anna's perspective for the entire mm -hmm. movie. And yes, there are a couple of scenes that we see that don't involve her, but we're still kind of just like peering in and seeing what's happening and we're not following and we're not focused on like the emotional connections of these characters or what's driving these characters. We don't know what's motivating them. All we know is crime is crime. Yeah, and I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that our two main characters aren't a part of it. You know, we get mm -hmm. it. You know, when we're not getting it from Naomi Watts' point of view, we're getting it from Mortensen's point of view. And having it from those two points of view, they're not in it. They're trying mm -hmm. to get in it, but they're not in it. And and I think this is something like Cronenberg's obviously really good at what he does. I mean, David Cronenberg, you know, he's very popular, kind of a cult hero for a reason. It's because he knows what he's doing. And I think a lot of times when you watch a new school gangster movie or even one from the same era as Eastern Promises, mm -hmm. what a lot of these bad movies do, I think about like Jean-Claude Van Damme movies that came out around the same time or Steven Seagal or something like that. They always have these scenes with the, uh, with the bad guy twirling his mustache. They mm -hmm. have those scenes of like, 
It's so over the top. And Drive does it too, but I love Drive. I think Drive does it in an interesting way because Ron Perlman and Brian Cranston are actually kind of likable in that movie. So when Albert Brooks is discussing what he's doing, we're still kind of watching from other people's eyes. But And that's more of a stylistic thing. All of that's to say, Eastern Promises doesn't give you that scene. The scenes of them being bad are ones that you kind of have to deduce that they're being bad. And is it hard to deduce? No. It's very clear that this guy wants to get Naomi Watts alone so he can kill her, so he can stop her, so he can threaten her, so he can do whatever he wants to do. But it's making you feel uncomfortable with Naomi Watts rather than watching him torture some guy that we don't care about or beat up some guy we don't care about or stab some guy we don't care about. It's always being shown from the point of view of characters that we can invest in. And I think that always is going to work better because we're supposed to be sympathizing and empathizing with the protagonist. A lot of these new school gangster movies and such, they are putting you in a scene where you're not sympathizing or empathizing with the character who is having the bad thing happen to them. Yeah, exactly. And <clears throat> if we think about it, like there's not a scene in this movie that's just like gangsters being gangsters for no reason. Mm -hmm. Even the opening scene, which is gangsters being gangsters, it's so pivotal to the overall story. When we find out that, you know, mm -hmm. um, Nikolai is disposing of the body and he disposes of it in a very specific way in order to ensure that the cops find it to get his message mm -hmm. and everything. Like we find out what's going on and it justifies everything i think the most i guess the most gangsters being gangsters scene is when uh the teenage boys killed after the football match mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and it, it seems kind of irrelevant based on everything else but we know what's happening there because we also know that krill is this person who's just paranoid that people are going to know that he's a gangster and they're going to come get him because he's so sloppy at what he does. Well, he's also what he's also paranoid about is that people know he's gay. And I think yeah. that's a big, like, obviously that's a massive storyline in this movie, but it's also a pretty interesting storyline because in 2007, we weren't really seeing this as much. Now I always say like one of the biggest, everybody always says, Oh, we didn't see this at all before. In 1975 dog day afternoon came out and that has one of the biggest gay storylines like, maybe of all time. And it was happening mm -hmm. in 1975 and it was very similar. It was these bank robbers, but yeah. twist here they come. So the fact that in this movie, it is, you know, it is him trying to hide this in this situation where it would not be okay. And where, you know, the scene where he has big, I want to prove that you're not gay. And he's watching him have sex with the, the, the mm -hmm. prostitute. Yeah. He's watching video the entire time. And so like the fact that he's, battling with his like masculinity in this very macho group. And then he's also terrible at being a gangster. Like he just doesn't belong in this world at all. And we see his humanity come out at the end when he's, when he can't kill the baby because mm -hmm. he's really not that bad of a guy, but it's one of those things when you're born into it. And we'll talk about that with Godfather two and Fredo, when you're born into it, sometimes you just feel like you don't have a choice. Mm -hmm. Well, and, that, and that another thing when we're talking about like the homosexuality in the film is you have to take, take into effect this is a Russian aspect on mm -hmm. this too, and a lot of a lot of North American perception on Russian culture is very skewed based on five decades of propaganda mm -hmm. through the Cold War and everything. But it, it's sometimes it's hard to remember that like even now. Being a homosexual in Russia is way more dangerous than it is in almost any other first world country. Absolutely. And and so to think that even like a decade and a half ago when Easter Promises came out, like people are getting persecuted for being gay in Russia. Mm -hmm. And so when you have that aspect of the cultural thing influencing this movie, it's so huge to see because one of the best things that Cronenberg does in this film is he actually portrays the Russians, not just as the stereotypical evil Russians, mm -hmm. but as actual like Russians doing evil things. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and that's, and that's like something too, with the Godfather part two, we see mm -hmm. the fall or the rise, whatever you want to call it of Cuba and I think most people at this point would call it the fall of Cuba, the fact that Castro then comes into power for as long as he did. 
Um, I mean, I, whatever way you want to take that, but Eastern promise, like, so the Godfather part two is taking place at a time when there wasn't this anti Cuban propaganda that then I grew up with my entire life. And now we're seeing obviously in Cuba, there's the, there's the protesting in the streets going on now, which I think it started yesterday, which is ironic that I literally watched the movie that day. And now we're gonna be talking about it, but yeah, Eastern promises is being set in a time where how much longer after the cold war was this it it feels like a long time but it's not like oh the cold war ended so now we love russians here in america now we love like it didn't it didn't happen overnight and and you're right it is very skewed and this wasn't one of those movies where it was you know a summer beach volleyball thing where the Russian volleyball player is going to come and kill you like mm-hmm. these these really were like normal russian people who yep. just happened like they were putting on the front but they were living the lives that a lot of normal russian uh immigrants will live in america which is work like owning your own restaurant having that authentic food that other people can't have i mean i worked at an armenian restaurant for like three months in la and like yeah like it's it's totally different than like what you're going to expect when you walk into that and like it is with the borscht and all of that it's 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 so much different than what the actual perspective from the rest like from what america thinks of armenia russia all that mm-hmm. so yeah this movie does a good job of kind of handling the stereotypes and yes there's still russian mafia at the end of the day but it gets into the details of russian mafia and they're not just russian mafia because it's cool to be mu- russian mafia it is very much just like how the italian mafia got started up at the beginning of you know what the 40s or the 30s or mm-hmm. the 20s whatever it was yeah and cronenberg again even goes further into detail cronenberg's detail attention to detail when it came to the tattoos used in this movie mm-hmm, is incredible mm-hmm. because he actually spent months gathering research on tattoos so he could properly portray them on these characters mm-hmm. and, and even just like the way they're describing the tattoos and how they are uh, cause the one Scotland yard agent is explaining, you know, you get these tattoos when you're in jail and they tell your life story mm-hmm. and Cronenberg made sure that he was being accurate in his depiction on these so that it was as tonally appropriate as possible. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we see like what a big deal this is when he does get those tattoos and how monumental that will be. And then also how big it is when, uh, when when he does show them to the the police officer and it's like wow like you've literally hit the point of no return at this point um it's it, yeah i mean it's always good to see when directors really do go all in on it and it's not just like oh look it's the sign of the wolf because we're the wolf mafia like mm-hmm. we're the gang like we're, we have our our pride or whatever you call it. like it is cool when it feels more realistic. And I think Cronenberg movies, a lot of times they actually have a way of feeling sometimes like too realistic. And sometimes his movies can get bogged down in the realism, which ultimately leads to them being maybe a little bit more boring or a little bit more tedious than what he intends it to be. Um, to me, he's very much like Steven Soderbergh, which I just watched his movie, no sudden move this week. And Soderbergh, I, to me, is one of those directors where he's always so close to making a perfect movie, but there's always something that bothers me. I like pretty much every Soderbergh movie, but I don't love really probably more than one of them. Mm-hmm. Cronenberg kind of does the same thing, but the attention to detail in Eastern Promises is kind of on uh, like a next level kind of attention to detail that you, you can't help but respect. Um mm-hmm. One of my biggest problems with this movie, and I don't want to, you know, I don't know if you have like a rebuttal to that before I get into my biggest problem, but I do have one of my biggest problems with the movie here, which is um, I personally don't love the setup of this movie. I think that's one of my mm-hmm. biggest problems with the movie. Um, I, I'm okay with this. Oh, well, you know, like the Mulholland Drive type thing. I don't know where yeah. I am and now I'm going to arrive and I'm just going to kind of flit around. I mean, The Passenger by Michelangelo Antonioni is amazing. I mean, it's and that is Jack Nicholson just determining, oh, I'm going to be this guy now. Um, yeah. And, and I, I love all of that. But in this one, to me, it just felt a little force that she just takes it and goes. And, and I wanted to know more of why is Naomi Watts going to just take that from her? And I know she speaks Russian and I know she has all that, but why would you take this off of like a mysterious dead body and not discuss it with really anybody else who is in that situation? To me, like 
it's just a weird setup. But as soon as it gets going, I really have no problems with the movie. It's just it's a weird opening uh, that gets it moving for me. Yeah, I understand that. It's kind of weird to think like, <clears throat> oh, this nurse is stealing from this dead person. Mm-hmm. Uh, especially, especially with the justification of yeah, we do it all the time. Yeah, I, I that was Pretty kind fine, of a weird but, thing. Yeah, but okay. Uh, but I think it really came down to just Naomi Watts' character's morals. And she felt morally obligated to find this child's family rather than uh, letting it go into foster care or whatever. Mm-hmm. And I think that really is part because of that theme of family in the movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think family is obviously very important. And we see we hear that she ended up having a... Uh, uh, miscarriage or something along those lines. Mm-hmm. And, and that might be why she's a little bit more invested. But again, like with a Cronenberg movie, they're so realistic. Like I watched the Paddington movies this week and yep. in the Paddington movies, when Paddington shows up, nobody's like, Oh my God, what's a bear doing here talking? It's just like, yeah, okay. Come with it. Like it's, yep. it's known that that is something that can exist in that world. And I think what throws me off about this movie is it is so grounded in everything mm-hmm. it does. I mean, every little moment is so grounded that I almost wanted a little bit more of an explanation as to why she is doing this because it doesn't feel as grounded as everything else in the movie. I mean, down to that bathhouse scene is so grounded, even though it is so over the top and so it is grounded in a reality. Mm -hmm. To me, this just feels like it's a little bit of a reach. And I don't feel uh, what bothers me the most is I don't think it was that hard of a thing to really tie up easily. No, because it's probably something that does involve just like a simple scene of dialogue mm-hmm. from probably Vigo Mortensen's character just asking, why are you so invested in this? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Right. And, and that, that's all it takes to clear it up. So I, I, I get the complaint. Uh, I kind of. You can turn it off. Game. I can turn it off just because I, I do think the rest of the film is so well developed that it's mm-hmm. fine. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and 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 again, like I mean, there's going to be plenty of movies as we start rolling through mine where there are plenty of things that you could nitpick or do, and it all comes down to preference. I mean, mm-hmm. there's some people who will just go with it right from the beginning, and there's certain movies where I will just go with it, like I just said, like The Passenger and, and other movies like that. But then there's some where, you know, I, I I don't know. I mean, maybe again, it just comes down to my my unfair expectations coming into this movie because what I remembered were those iconic moments that even in 2007, in a crowded year with Call It and I Drink Your Milkshake and and I, I guess Atonement kind of had the ending, which are here mm-hmm. at least getting out of the fountain. That was a pretty big scene. Yep. Or Juno saying I'm pregnant. That was all in the same year. That's yep. all in the same year. And and. Still, Eastern Promises has so many incredibly memorable moments. And I think that maybe it's just my unfair expectation of me going, oh, wait, that's what the setup for this movie was? Um, also, though, like the opening opening is so visceral mm-hmm. and pulls you in so immediately that then it's almost like, why Why do I need Naomi Watts right after that? Why can't yep. something a little bit more bring Naomi Watts into this than just – this woman, like the woman dying is fine, but why does it just have to be this book? Why can't it be something mm-hmm. a little bit more than that? I guess that's just really where my complaint comes in. Yeah, and, and I think part of that does kind of feel like Naomi Watts doesn't feel like she's completely connected to this Russian heritage of herself. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, and she's I Australian. Think, yeah. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't help that, it. That is a thing, yeah. Blatantly Australian. Continue. But... um. <laughs> But even like her having her uncle who is Russian in the house and everything, right? It still does. It still kind of feels like this bit of disconnect. You can understand why she would have a British accent living in London with Russian family. Like it, it makes sense. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, it just doesn't feel like we get these hints at like her father and her connection to her father with like the motorcycle and her father's borscht and stuff like that. But it isn't really nailed home that she is connected to her Russian heritage at all. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. I feel like she's almost a little too distant from it. Maybe that's because she doesn't have the father. And then, I mean, we hear the racist remark from the uncle. Mm-hmm. So maybe that's also why she was going and dating who she was dating. Maybe that's mm-hmm. something to kind of show her disconnect from the Russian background. So maybe it's all to set up her disconnect from her Russian heritage. Yep. That could very well just be what the case is. Um, but I do agree. I think that there should have been a little bit more about her Russian heritage because 
the problem is Viggo Mortensen's character is so mysterious the whole movie that mm -hmm. to have both of your main characters be so mysterious, it's almost a little too much. It's kind of like how mm -hmm. I love Magnolia. I got it in like, I think my top 25 or something, but I was talking to somebody about that movie and he said, one dying father's fine. Two dying fathers is one too many. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's just, sometimes it can feel that way where when it's kind of the, when both characters are going through the same thing, what are we grounded in? What do we know as an audience? And, you know, clearly it's your 77th best movie ever. So you have plenty of, you're fine with this stuff mm -hmm. clearly. But yeah. for me, it's just watching this for the first time in years. It's like, huh, maybe they, maybe they should have given us something a little bit more here. Yeah. And I mean, especially <laughs> when you have, I mean, two very underrated actors in Naomi Watts and Viva Mortensen in this film, you mm -hmm. could have given them more to work with at mm -hmm. times. Yeah. Yeah. And, and maybe more Naomi Watts than, than Viggo. Because mm -hmm. I do feel like Vincent Cassell sometimes can steal the show because Vincent Cassell mm -hmm. has a little bit more wiggle room to steal the show. Naomi yeah. Watts, like I talked about Saoirse Ronan and I said like she's going to be our Meryl Streep. She's our generation's Meryl Streep. I love Saoirse Ronan. Every movie she's in is gold. Naomi Watts is probably my favorite actress. I mm -hmm. love the role she takes. I love the movie she's in. Um, I, I, you know, obviously everybody's got their bad movies, but the she ne she hates Hollywood, mm -hmm. and 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 that's one of the things that I think actually benefits her is she's never taking a role just to appease or kiss ass or anything like that. She is always taking roles that are difficult. Twenty one mm -hmm. Grams, she gets nominated. The Impossible, she gets nominated. Mulholland Drive, I don't think she did get nominated, but she should have. These are difficult roles. And Birdman, her whole entire character is. F you Hollywood. Like I hate yeah. you leave me alone. And so I really respect like pretty much everything she does. And this is another one of those difficult roles slash movies that she does such a good job with. Um, but could we have gotten a little bit more from her so that her character, and I'm not saying it's got to be like Clementine Krasinski and Joel from, mm -hmm. uh, from eternal sunshine, but like, could we have gotten a little bit more from her and a little bit less from Vigo rather than, I mean, the one scene that actually we do see that is when she confronts Vincent Cassell, when Vigo Mortensen's mm -hmm. like, get the hell out of here. What are you doing? That's the one time we really do see that. But at that point I'm like, give me a little bit, uh, just give me a little bit more before that. Just give me a little bit yeah. before that. And, and again, I'm complaining, but I still think this movie is a very good movie and closer mm -hmm. to a three and a half out of four star movie than a two and a half out of four star movie. Yeah, and, and I, I get it, and it's it's also weird watching a Cronenberg movie that doesn't have like a visceral body horror the entire time, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? Like it, it's a different type of Cronenberg movie, and I think that's where a lot of my appreciation comes from. It a lot of my appreciation for it comes from the mm -hmm. fact that I studied Russian culture in university, so seeing this accurate depiction of the Russian culture, even if it is focusing on the mafia, is really nice to see in a mainstream American film. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, she's she, Naomi Watts, I guess, is actually English. I'm on her her Wikipedia here. But, you know, she's an Australian and English or something like mm -hmm. that. She's in. But but anyway, um, no, I do. I do agree. And and now let's let's talk about that bathhouse scene before we actually do yes. move on to Godfather Part Two. That scene. So there, there's like something attached to the Blu-ray that mm -hmm. is called like two men walk into a bathhouse or something. And what I always find amazing is when you can create a scene that is can be defined by exactly what happens in the scene but before the monumental part like if you were talking about uh the pulp fiction two guys talk mm -hmm. about a foot rub you'd know exactly what you were talking about you yeah. know or or two guys like like you could you could do that all the time that's when you know a scene is like iconic when you can have when i could have that conversation with you in front of other people and mm -hmm. we don't give away what happens in that scene but we're both sitting there smiling because we're like yeah that's yeah. what happens in that scene this scene is so well done. It's like brutally realistic. I mean, we see Viggo Mortensen get stabbed. We see him get cut. We see all this stuff. And, and his fighting starts to get weaker as it goes on. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that, you know, a lot of times we'll see them be like, oh, oh, I'm hurt. But I feel like Vigo's performance, his physical performance here is so unreal. The way he's able to just physically start to seem drained as the blood is dripping from him and everything is happening to him. And, and he really is on like his last leg as he's fighting this guy's. It, there's just something special about this scene that I feel like you don't always get in these types of scenes. Yeah, and I think a lot of it comes down to the setup for this scene. I mean, we were talking about how the setup didn't really pay off, or there wasn't enough setup earlier <laughs> in the film. But this film setup is all brought about by the fact that 
he's getting his stars because the reason he's getting his stars mm -hmm. is so that they can pretend he's Krill to get such other a great, such a case. great twist. Yeah. And like you go into that scene having no idea what's coming and just like, Oh, he's like congratulating him on becoming a captain. Now, like everything's good. And then all of a sudden he walks out and he's like, you'll recognize him by his stars. And you're like, Oh, mm -hmm. Oh, and then, and then you get this incredibly choreographed fight that, as you said, like Mortensen's performance in it is outstanding because you just you feel everything he's feeling throughout that entire fight because he does just start draining throughout it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean it's 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 really unreal, and like we don't really know these other two guys, but but our moment of realization of, Oh my God, he was set up to be Kirill because before that, like we still think that he's in with the Russian mom mm -hmm. and he's just getting promoted because they need somebody to promote. And now with this realization's coming and that's why all of this happened to him. Like, it's almost like he realized it. It seems like he realized that as soon as the guy left the room, because he mm -hmm. takes the towel off and he just kind of puts it around his neck. Cause it's like, I'm about to have to do something. And, um, it's so well choreographed. It's so well acted. It's it's just it's top notch the entire mm -hmm. time, and it's just I I don't know. Yeah, it's it's hard to put into words when a scene is that well executed to explain exactly why it's so well executed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and yeah, this is one of those scenes. Like this is one of those scenes that it gets hype and it deserves the hype and it lives up to the hype. And every time you watch it, it lives up to the hype. Like it just works. It yep. just works, and uh, yeah, it, he. I don't know. Good for Cronenberg. Cronenberg has a way, though, in his movies of always mm -hmm. pulling out one of those scenes. I mean, in The Fly, mm -hmm. there's a couple of them, but in yeah. Crash, he has one of those scenes. He's very good at being able to pull something like yeah. this where you're going to remember the movie for whatever scene it is. Yeah, exactly. Uh, he He's a very talented director, and because he spent so much time in that horror genre, he – doesn't quite get the respect he deserves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and 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 he does. He gets he gets this cult following, but he doesn't mm -hmm. get he doesn't get like the the critical following. Or I guess he gets yeah. critical, but he doesn't get like the mainstream following that he really does that he should have. And I mean, a history of violence with Vigo came out what two years before Eastern Promises, which came out four yeah. years before Dangerous Met. Like all those movies just kept coming. A movie like Cosmopolis, uh, yeah, but you know, <laughs> but there's enough in there, and it just seems. I mean, unfortunately, I think we might be at the end of his uh, career. I know he's got Crimes mm -hmm. of the Future, TBA, but I mean, he is. How old is he now? He is 78 years old. I feel that. Yeah. I feel that he might be on his way out, especially since his last couple of movies just really were not um, su successful in mm -hmm. really any way. So definitely. That's it. All right, you got anything last you want to say about uh, about this movie before we move on nope. to Godfather Part 2? Nope. All right, let's not move on to Godfather Part 2. What's the best thing you watched this week? The Last Black Man in San Francisco. Mm, haven't seen that one. Very good. I was I, I had heard a lot of hype about it. I mean, it's an A24 film, so it, mm -hmm. you know, A24 film fans, they're they're a uh, peculiar type and they're very adamant about how good a24 films are so i i went in and i was like okay this probably isn't as good as people made it out to be it was better than people made it out to be mm -hmm. that movie is absolutely incredible it's just such a touching movie about the feeling of like being left behind from the world around you it, it, it's very well done yeah i always I, so i never saw last black man in san francisco i wanted to see it and it's always hard for me nowadays because mm -hmm. Rotten Tomatoes to me has just become a place where it's to me, Rotten Tomatoes is nonsense. Rotten Tomatoes yeah. is, is a dumpster. It, it's, I don't like, it used to feel like, okay, we actually are going to get something from this, but now it kind of feels like whatever political mood somebody's in, that's what they're going to give this movie, whatever mm -hmm. emotional mood this person's in. I mean, I watched Paddington two this week and I'm like, okay, I'd love to be the one person who was like, I hated this yeah. movie. And so I just like when I see a movie like The Last Black Man in San Francisco and, and you know, some of these some movies that like Black Widow comes out this week and mm -hmm. Black Widow got pretty good reviews and I don't like the Marvel movies. So I wasn't going to see it anyway. Uh, sometimes I wonder to myself, like, why did, is this movie actually really good? Is this movie getting the reviews because it's more of the time and maybe in five years it's not going to be as good? Like, what is it about this movie? But The Last Black Man in San Francisco is one that has been on my list for a while. And um, 
I don't really know why I missed it. I think I missed it at the time because it wasn't nominated for any Oscars or if it mm -hmm. was, it was only nominated for like one or something like that. And I think that's why I ended up missing it, but I certainly should. Um, I certainly should check that one out. I'm glad, yeah, I'm glad I mean, you watched it. I, I, I give it four and a half stars. Like it's actually something that I would consider putting in my top 100 next time I revisit this list. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Also, there's a guy on here. I'm, I'm, I went to the, the Rotten Tomatoes for this. He gave it three out of five stars and it's a rotten. How can it be more than half but be rotten? Yeah. It doesn't make I think sense. It's like, yeah. It does make sense. Um, all right. So I watched I watched Pad I watched both Paddingtons this week. They're so good. Paddington 2 is I think is probably the best live action family movie, maybe ever, in the history of time. Yeah. Like The Wizard of Oz, I guess, is like a live action family movie, but like it's not really. This is like a full blown, this was made for children and families to enjoy together. It's so entertaining. Um and and I always throw two because I'm I'm selfish. But then the other one that I watched, uh, I bought the the massive. I'm gonna pick this up. I bought the massive Ingmar Bergman like Criterion yeah. collection thing because it was half off, and I was like, all right, I can spend 150 bucks for 40 movies and a gigantic book. And so I'm, I'm watching in the order Criterion recommends, and I watched uh, Smiles of a Summer Night last night. That is, I mean. I'm sure people hate Woody Allen at this point. Um, that is like the horniest movie I've ever seen in my entire life. And it was made in 1955. And like all anybody wants to do the entire movie is sleep with each other. So two very different movies. Um, mm -hmm. But it was also very nice to see an Ingmar Bergman movie where he's not – where he's looking at aging and dying and youth and youth being wasted and youth going away and not in a way where you're like, ah, after this one, I'm going to sit in a bathtub and cry for four hours. He yeah. did it in a very comical uplifting way. And it's such a good movie. It's so entertaining. So if you're looking for two movies that'll make you feel good, watch summer uh, smiles of a summer night and watch Pat, watch both Paddington's, but Paddington too, especially I think is a damn perfect movie. Um, that is Brandon Gleason's edition. Hugh Grant is hilarious in it. It is just top to top to bottom a great movie. Two very different movies, but they'll both make you smile, and uh, they're both worth your time. Um, although I probably wouldn't watch Smiles of a Summer Night with children. That's that's my one warning there. Paddington Two can be watched with anyone. The other one, not so much. Um, but you liked the first Paddington. That was actually I one did. of your movies. At it one was point. one of my movies at one point, and I just haven't gotten around to the second one yet. But I do intend to, and I'm very glad to hear that uh you also enjoyed them thoroughly. they're so good yeah, yeah they're they're so good and uh i gotta say <laughs> probably be watching those more often than i care to admit uh, yeah they're so, so they're good. very entertaining all right for something completely different going back to what the theme of this is which is gangsters and ruining your life and killing people uh the godfather part two so i grew up uh i don't look it but believe it or not i am sicilian it makes no sense don't ask me my uh i got one of those uh, 23 and me things. It proved I was like 40% Sicilian. Um, I'm the part with the red hair. My Italian side of the family is the redhead side. My dad's favorite movies growing up, the Godfather one and the Godfather two. Now, what is the one thing that we all do as we grow up? We try to be different from what our parents are. We don't want to do that. So every time you try to have a movie conversation, you bring up any movie you could bring up, like I could talk about Paddington to him. I'd say, Oh, the Godfather two is better. Okay, yeah, but but that's not what I was talking about. I just wanted to talk about how Paddington 2 is better. So my whole entire kind of like life, it's been like, okay, The Godfather and The Godfather 2 are overrated because my dad doesn't stop talking about them. Like those are the only movies he'll talk about. And I have not seen The Godfather 2 probably in about seven years, six years. And I sat down and watched it. And like, you know what? Like sometimes, sometimes your parents are obnoxious about certain things because they're right. You know, like the the like I'm gonna be obnoxious about the dark side of the moon when I'm when I'm older, and my kids gonna be like, "Why am I listening to this thing that's like older than you?" Because it's great, because it just works. And The Godfather Part Two is one of those movies where it's unbelievable how they manage to show two movies that are both obviously Michael Corleone's is a little bit longer, but one movie that's probably two hours and fifteen minutes long, the other one that's probably about an hour long. Yeah. Show the rise of these two people in such different ways and show that ultimately at the end of it, you, one rise was more idealistic and the other rise was all about, yeah, it's family, 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 but you can't get there anymore. Mm -hmm. The parallel of these two stories is so incredible 
And something I threw at John, and I just have to say before I turn it over to him, the first two Godfather movies, they had six different actors nominated for Best Supporting Actor at the Oscars. That is insane. Six different, different. The first one was James Caan, Al Pacino, and Robert Duvall. The second one was Lee Strasberg, Michael uh, Gasco, or Va yeah, Michael V. Gasco, and, and Robert De Niro. That is insane. And yet it still wins best actor for one of them and probably should have won best actor for this one. Art Carney certainly shouldn't have won, but Jack Nicholson certainly was in the running for his role in Chinatown. It is so crazy. John Cazale doesn't get nominated at all. John Cazale, who is so incredible in these movies, gets nothing. And his scene about getting passed over is unreal. And he can't fit. There's nowhere to put him. So yeah. – it just it really is epic in every way, these first two movies. And this one, um, as a sequel, for anybody, you know, for all these arguments, what's the best sequel of all time? What's the best sequel of all time? What's the best sequel of all time? I'll probably have to put my foot in my mouth because I'll look at my letterbox or my top hundred and say, ooh, I have a different sequel there. But to me, it probably isn't close. This is is probably the easiest thing when you're ranking movies. What's the best blank? It's the easiest thing to say this is the best sequel. Yeah, and it's really – I my first note that I wrote down is it takes a certain amount of gusto to follow up one of the greatest American films of all time with one of the greatest American films <laughs> of all time. Yeah. At a time when they weren't doing this. Yeah, and that that's the big thing. It's like this isn't like nowadays where you're launching franchises off of successful movies. This is back in the 70s where sequels were – you weren't even at the point where you were getting like a million horror sequels in 74. Like to have a sequel to the Godfather of all things, it's incredulous to think about. Mm -hmm. I can only imagine what people like you and I would be responding with when we would find out that news that they were making a sequel to the Godfather. Yeah. And, 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 Really, Jaws the next year is what changes the game with the sequel thing. Mm -hmm. um, because Jaws is such a big hit that then it's, oh, let's just make another, let's make Jaws 2. Let's make Jaws yeah. 3D. Let's make whatever. That's when it really changes. Now, movies before Jaws obviously get their remakes. The Exorcist has about 19, 19 sequels, and you know they're all pretty bad. The Exorcist 3 is pretty good, but they're all pretty bad. But, but to go out and, and really create a sequel to a movie that didn't need a sequel. Mm -hmm. Did it? Did we want a sequel? Probably. I mean, the ending of The Godfather 1 is very open-ended. It's very much just like, okay, Michael is now taking over. And we do want to see how Michael is going to handle the family business. But to do it two years later and make it this good. Mm -hmm. and, and this isn't like Lord of the Rings. Obviously, the Lord of the Rings movies all came out year after year after year. They were all filmed at the same time, though. They were all filmed at like in 2000 or whatever it was, and they all just went over. That's why nobody ages in those movies. Mm -hmm. But this wasn't being done ahead of time. The Godfather 1 was almost a massive failure. If you read about the, the history of The Godfather 1, it seemed like it was going to be a disaster. And so to follow it up with this movie and to say, you know what? We're going to take the backstory of Vito Corleone. And we're going to parallel it with the, the current story of Michael. Two people who didn't want to be in these situations but really had no choice because of what happened with their families. And show how one wanted the family and one wanted the power. Mm -hmm. And show the difference in that. It's, it's just so incredibly well done. And, and then also to set it against the backdrop of, of what's going on in Cuba and, and Fidel Castro coming to power and, and all that. Like, it's just, it's thinking on another level. The first movie is so contained, even though there's parts in Sicily mm -hmm. and stuff. This movie is all over the map. It's showing the spread. And it's it's kind of like a, uh, it's uh, it's it's what happens when capitalism kind of gets in the way here, you know? And I'm, yeah. you know, that's not, that's not an anti-capitalist statement, but it, it, capital, there is a certain point where you go too far. There is a certain point where you just go too far. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, when we're looking at like these things about like casino expansion and things like that, which is the reason why they're getting invested in Cuba in the first place and why we're in Nevada is because, and that's a big 
part of Las Vegas and Reno's history mm-hmm. is <laughs> the gangs affiliated with creating these casinos mm-hmm. to get money and everything. It, it's it's so well executed and on such a level. And it, it's impossible to talk about The Godfather Part 2 without talking about The Godfather mm-hmm. because they are so equal in, in where they fall in film's pantheon. And the fact that some of the brilliance of The Godfather Part 2 is its relation to The Godfather Part mm-hmm. 1. And this movie, a third of this movie is a prequel. Yeah. But you don't see people complaining about it like they do about prequels nowadays. Because, because, and and we talked about this. So I just, I finished Mayor of Easttown. I hated it. I thought it was so, like, it, there was a couple good moments. But it was, for the most part, it was a bloated thing. And we talked about how nowadays miniseries, every miniseries gets called brilliant and so good and everything. Because at the end of every miniseries, it's like, got them. And then none of that ever takes, none of that ever matters again. But it keeps your interest and stuff like that. And miniseries a lot of times now are between eight and 10 episodes. So normally you figure they're about 50 minutes long each. You're looking at about between seven and nine hours, somewhere in there. These two movies are six and a half hours long. There's not a minute of filler in either of them. And and that is that is just impeccable storytelling. And it shows that you can tell a story without having to, without having to just put in the unnecessary filler. And like you had said, oh, well, people like the idea that they can just stop after one episode, but then they never do. They keep watching. They'll watch three at a time, but then they'll say the Godfather's too long because it's three hours long. But what the God the Godfather part two could have been two separate movies. They could have made two two hour, two and a half hour movies. Kind of like what Marvel does now. Every Marvel movie is like two and a half hours long. They just keep going and going and going and going and going and going. And they don't need to be two and a half hours long. Like you can shorten that up. But they elected not to. They elected to show you the important parts. They elected to show you the important parts of both people. And nothing is lost in this. Because you don't have those random filler moments. You don't have fake love stories. We don't care. And that's something that Hollywood needs to understand. We don't care how the Godfather married his wife. We do not care how they met and how they fell in love. Han Solo only became Han Solo because Amelia Clark is hot. That's why Han Solo is Han Solo. If you watch Solo, that's pretty much what happens. We don't care about that kind of thing. Like when you're watching this movie. All we care about is from just Robert De Niro's eyes in this movie, you can tell how important his family is to him. We don't need to see them meet cute and all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. There's so many great decisions like that. And to show how Robert De Niro in this movie is able to have the relationship with his wife and still build his empire while Michael does not have that ability at all with Kay while he's building his empire. I mean, we get it from, you know, three minute scenes rather than 25 minute scenes. It's, it's our 23 minute scenes piled on top of each other. It's just, it's just impeccably tight for a three hour and 20 minute movie. Mm-hmm. And it, it's really important to note <clears> that <throat> this movie does not hold the same emotional impact, same significance. If it doesn't have both of these storylines, because they are, it's so important to see Vito's journey to understand Michael's journey. Mm-hmm. Well, because because you see um, Vito's optimism. Mm -hmm. Michael has no optimism. Really, what The Godfather Part 2 is, is you're watching a man become nothing. You're watching a man become a monster. Mm -hmm. In the first Godfather, Michael is the one who wants nothing to do with it. That's my family, Kay. That's not me. He literally says that in like the first scene he is in, in the first Mm -hmm. movie. And yet we see that he's the one who's most obsessed by it. He can't help it. He's in it and he's he's a manipulative mother effer. He can't help it. And so as he continues to move his way through, every human becomes a pawn in his game to get total power and to keep whatever safe, you know, whatever version of the family safe that he's got in his head. And it gets all the way to him being alone. And at the end of this movie, What I love about this movie is Fredo gets shot. We see all of them young. 
or, you know, back before, before anybody died, we see Sonny, we see Tessio, we see all of them. By the way, Clemenza, the actor, had died before this movie. That's why he's not in it. He was supposed to be a bigger role in this, but he was dead. Um, and so we see all of that. And then it just shows Michael alone, and that's how the movie ends. Oh, it's so beautiful. It's absolutely it's beautiful. Brilliant. It's brilliant. No, it, it, it's gorgeous. And it, it, it's these little details that Coppola puts into the film that, that really is what elevates it so much. And it's why a three and a half hour film. I was talking about how The Revenant felt bloated last week. Mm -hmm. The Godfather Part Two is not a bloated film, mm -mm. it doesn't feel that way at all. And it's these little moments. It's the fact that our opening scene with um, the first scene with Michael at the part at his son's birthday party. And it's the fact that it's mirroring the wedding scene from the, the first film and just the difference in how people are approaching Vito versus Michael. It's so important and so telling. And you don't even have to remind the audience of the difference between the two. Mm -hmm. You just have to show it. And the audience understands in that moment that this is a completely different style of power and a different struggle for power than was presented well, in the first film. And I think what's, I think what's really telling is when um, Frankie walks up there and says, not one Italian in the entire band. There's not mm -hmm. one Italian in the entire band. And I think what that's showing is when Vito was building, he was building in New York and he was building for the betterment of what he felt were his people. He was building for the better of the Italians who were living in New York. You know, in this movie, we see him say, if he's Italian, leave him alone. What does it matter? Mm -hmm. And, and, and there was like a loyalty there. You know, there was a loyalty, perhaps too strong of a loyalty, but there was a loyalty because back in the early 1900s, when Italians were coming to the country, people didn't exactly love Italians in America. It wasn't like, Oh good. Another Italian. No. I mean, there was a lot of hatred towards Italians, a lot of xenophobia towards Italians. And so when we see him going for the Italians in that whole first movie, that whole first scene is Italians everywhere. Mm -hmm. There is not a non-Italian in the room except for Tom Hagen. He's the only one, yep. but he's family. In this movie, you get the senator who can't even say Corleone. He calls him Corleone. You have... Uh, all the whole band is not Italian. They're in Nevada. What the hell are they doing out in Nevada? Like, what do they need to do out in Lake Tahoe? That's not where their roots are. That's not where their family is. And it's this idea of expanding just beyond what you're actually capable of. And, and this American dream in the fifties, I mean, this was the American dream, get out there and live on a piece of land rather than being stuck in the city. And, and that's what this was. And, and it's, it's, it's it's about forgetting who you are mm -hmm. as you follow this this dream and you forget where you come from and what it was that was so important to you and so important to the people who you held in the highest respect your whole life. Yeah, I mean that that's just this big thing and it's it's there's so many few moments there's so few moments where it really shows how little family matters to Michael. Mm -hmm. And of course there's there's of course one of the most iconic scenes of I know it was you, which, mm -hmm. you know, kind of breaks his connection to the family, but it's also the, the little things of him saying, telling them don't let K off the compound. Mm -hmm. Right. It's these little things that, that just build up to go show. And it, again, it's him denying to help his sister with her third marriage and mm -hmm. things like that. It's, the, these little aspects of family isn't at the forefront in this. It's all about business for Michael. Yeah. He, and, and all the people, they can't even get in to see him. Connie mm -hmm. can't get in to see him. Uh, Frankie can't get in to see him. But the senator can get in to see him. Oh, I'll sit down and talk to the senator. Do I just gave a check, even though he's going to insult my entire family and all of us? Um, it's, it's, it's devastating. I mean, the whole thing is just so devastating. Like Jordan says here, it's like Shakespearean. It really is. I mean, you're seeing this man who, who forgot that it was really about the family. And I think that's, what's interesting about these, these uh, Senate meetings is they're mm -hmm. calling it, they're calling it the Corleone crime syndicate or something like that. And yeah. you know, it's the Corleone family, the core, we called ourselves the family, but when it's talked about as the family, it's talked about in the past tense. Because that was 
One of my favorite scenes from the first Godfather is when all the five families meet and they're all sitting around talking. And and it's it, there's a respect there because they are all family. It's the Tatalias and you killed his son and now my son's dead. And this is and then the Barzini and all that. And then in this movie, where is the family? Where are the other family? Who are they competing with? They're not competing with anybody. They're competing with themselves. And the only people who can get in their way are the people that they're putting in their way. Hyman Roth. If you didn't try to do business with Hyman Roth, Hyman Roth would have never gotten your brother to attempt to kill you. Like, and and that's and that's where it's just getting lost. Is is like like Michael just gets lost in his own world because without Sonny, he doesn't really. Tr- the only one he trusts is Tom Hagen, but mm-hmm. he's leaving Tom Hagen out of too much. Can't trust Fredo. He doesn't have his father to point him in the right direction. The mother wants nothing to do with it. Connie's just off doing her own thing. And Kay is so distant. Michael really is on his own with this whole thing. And the only people he has around him are Al Neary and Rocco, who are never going to question him. It's it's the George Lucas walking out with Phantom Menace saying, we have a script. We have a script. And they're like, wait, we've been shooting for 10 days. That's what this is. There's nobody to question his absolute authority. Yeah, exactly. And – it's just, it really is nice seeing that like the power corrupts here and that we've seen the downfall. It, it's very important in a sequel to decide how you're going to portray a character. Are you going to portray them as the same char- character? Because if you do, they're probably going to be boring. Are they going to have character growth? Is it going to be positive character growth or negative character growth? And how does that interact with the themes of the first film and the themes of the second film? And with Michael, it's this idea that he's focusing too much on the business side of things, which is baited, forget the roots, which is what the entire Vito storyline is about, is the Mm -hmm. fact that everything Vito does through that phenomenal performance from Robert De Niro Mm -hmm. is for the family. It's Mm -hmm. shown when he goes to uh, murder uh, that one guy. Yeah, the black hand. When he murders him, and then the end of that sequence is him just sitting down with his family, mm-hmm. and like, and even the first the first time he steals is to get a rug for his wife. Exactly, and it's just like every single action he is taking is for family. Yeah, but Michael's just lost that. He's he, lost that connection. He doesn't understand what he's actually doing, and it means at the end. The end scene shows Michael as a child or as a young adult without his family there. But that's literally just synonymous for what Michael is at the end of the <laughs> film. He has nothing. Well, and it, it, it parallels to the end of the third movie, which is yeah. – and, and the third one gets a bad rap. But the third one is by no means a bad movie. It's just not on level with these two. And the third one is still a good movie, but – I know, John, you probably haven't seen the third one. I haven't seen seen the second one. So if you want to close your ears, that's fine. I totally understand. But at the end of the third one, we see him as an old man in this almost exact same shot, and he falls off the chair. Now, granted, the the Coda version came out where he doesn't fall off the chair, and it's like, all right, whatever. Thanks, Thanks, Francis Ford Coppola. You cut out three minutes of the movie and called it a new movie. Uh, (laughs) No. But but it's, it's the same thing. Except the whole third movie is about him trying to make amends and really trying to be mm-hmm. there for his kids. Uh, maybe to the extent that Sofia Coppola might be in too much of the movie. I don't know. What do I know? But but, but that is, that's what that movie's about because it's him trying to redeem himself because everything he has done has been lost now. He has lost everything. He has killed his only other living brother. He can't stand his sister. His wife has left and wants to take the kids. She's probably going to get them. His mother is dead. It's literally him. That is it. And Tom Hagen, he's even, you know, Tom Hagen, he's even given a hard time. And Hagen's, no, I'm, I'm staying. I'm yeah. staying. And, like, for as good as Michael is about the business, he does it, like, he says the right things. And that's, that's mm-hmm. you know, that's, I mean, that's the world in general. There's plenty of people who say the right things. And now that we have social media and stuff, you can say the right things anywhere you want. But it's the people who act on it that are actually meaningful. The people who don't just say it, who act on it, who say it and then actually back it up. Vito was somebody who backed it up. Sonny was even somebody who backed it up. Sonny was somebody who went out of his way to try to protect his sister and then ends up getting killed for it. 
Michael can't back it up. He can back up the business end, but everything he says about family is totally just mentioned. Yeah, I mean, it's it's one of those aspects where it's really just asking this question, is it worth it? Mm -hmm. Right? And for Vito, the family helps propel the business aspect of it. And for Michael, it, the business ended the family aspect of it. And the question becomes, is it worth it? Is all of this empire you've built worth it when you don't have family? And I think this is something we see a lot with like nepotism now, because nepotism has obviously become a bigger thing, especially in America. And I'm, I, I know it's like that around the world, but especially in America where we'll see this person's a director and now their daughter is a producer or their son is a producer. And like, what did they do other than grow up in it to become that, you know? And, and I mean, Sophia Coppola is a perfect example of it. She's a phenomenal director in my opinion, but then mm -hmm. as in terms of an actor, she's not as bad as people say she is, but she also got that role in the Godfather part three because her dad is Francis Ford Coppola. Like, yeah. and I think this says a lot about nepotism and sometimes when it's not you who built it, when it's not you who started it, it means so much less to you. Not that the business meant less to him, but what the business stood for meant less to him. To Michael, it was a business. To Vito, it was his life. Mm -hmm. and, and I think like what Vito's storyline is in this movie, what it really screams to me is if you want something, take it. There's always a way to get what you want. Now, I'm not telling you to go out and kill somebody because they're doing whatever. I'm not telling you to go out and rob from somebody. But in 1917, when those scenes are taking place, that's how you got what you wanted because there was organized crime and the police were all mm -hmm. on the tape, whatever. You didn't have a choice. And Vito is – America, like in my, it's like you, if you wanted to accomplish it, it's what America's idealistic view was. If you want to accomplish it, come to America and you'll accomplish it. You'll be able to move West. You'll be able to do everything. You'll be able to go from nothing to this if you just take it. And what Michael's is, is to me, you got it. You're there. You, you had an impact on it, but whatever. But now you don't know where to go with it because you're already so big. You're not starting from scratch. You're almost trying to find ways to make your life, to make everything else more interesting. So because you're so big already, how can you become the biggest? Mm -hmm. There's such a difference there. The American dream was not meant to be, how can I go from $300 million to $305 million? It was meant to be, how can I go from $10 in my pocket to owning something? Mm -hmm. And, and, I think we're seeing like the American dream and it's good. And then it's Amer the American dream and it's absolute worst. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's that idea of like, I mean, you said it, that like, it's not anti-capitalist sentiment or anything, mm -hmm. but this movie does kind of have an anti-capitalist outlook on things. Because if you like you take it in the time frame where you have the communist uprising in Cuba mm -hmm. and you have Michael focusing too much on the capitalist aspects of the business and losing his family because of it. It's it's really interesting to see these undertones that are put into this film, especially when you do consider that the the veto side of it is literally the exact opposite of it, where it does show that that idea of the American dream. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, I think I think what this movie does, I in my opinion, I think this movie is just very anti-government. I don't mm -hmm. think it's very anti-capitalist or anti-communist because it's showing that both are bad. Like, like, and it's 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 showing that really all forms of government, no matter which one we want to argue for, socialism, communism, capitalism, whichever one you're really fighting for, at the end of the day, government is government, and government kind of gets in the way in one way or the other. We see it with the capitalist mentality, we see it with the communist mentality, what's going on in, in Cuba, which was I guess labeled socialist at the time, but as we know, like it becomes very yeah. much an authoritarian government. And so when we see that, I feel like this movie is just very anti-government. I mean, even in the Michael Corleone scenes, when they think they got him and they're going to, they're going to pin it on him and get him for everything. We sit there and we watch it and we're like, well, it is kind of bullshit. They haven't caught him for anything. They haven't got – he hasn't been arrested once. He hasn't done anything. Like this is kind of bad. And then you start to get frustrated with the senators. But then also 
what are we doing? The only senator who stands up for him, the Italian Americans, I love my Italian Americans, is the one who killed the girl, the, the prostitute. And, mm -hmm. and who hates Italians, that we see them saying it to their face, and it's all such BS. I feel like yeah. this movie is just a very like anti-government movie, and I think what it's more saying is – I'm not saying I want to go live in 1917. Don't get me wrong. But I think what it's saying is that back in 1917, it was pretty simple. If you wanted something, you went and got it. If you did something, you were rewarded for it. There were people who – could control the entire town or the entire city. And that wasn't good, but there were, there were ways to make your life better. There were ways to get yourself out of the situation you were in. And I feel like this movie is like kind of saying later on, like what's going on in Cuba? What are we doing? What are we doing here in America? It just gets to the point of government is like now involved in everything, every single thing that's going on. And it's, it's too much. And I think that's kind mm -hmm. of, I think this movie is just a very anti-government movie. Yeah, I can definitely see that aspect of it, and especially when you do consider the fact that it is focusing on the familial, the familial aspect of everything too, because the family is kind of like its own form of government that kind of supersedes government in these films. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and even even when we're talking about like the, and it, I think it's perfectly echoed in the fact that like during the Senate hearing, which is kind of like your epitome of the representation of government in this film, Freddie doesn't rat out. Michael in the end and recants everything he said mm -hmm. because his brother's there because his family's there. His family yeah. is what saves Michael mm -hmm. from persecution. Yeah. And then Michael loses his family. And then Michael loses his family anyway. And yeah, so so before we wrap this up, I do just want to throw it out. And we're gonna we're gonna have more John Cazal talk because we're gonna have the Godfather part one and then we're gonna have the Deer Hunter, which he is yeah. a very big part of. But I think John Cazal gets no credit for what he does as Fredo. He's not as big. He's not sunny. Tom Hagen is, is more of like who you want to be. Uh, he's not Michael. He's not, he's not, he is the only one of the family other than the mother who wasn't nominated for an Oscar in either of the movies. He's the only one. Talia Shire was nominated for the second one. Um, and, and his acting and his performance when he's yelling at Michael right before Michael says to him, you're nothing to me. I never want to see you again. Mm -hmm. His acting in that scene when he's screaming, I was, I'm, you're my kid brother. I was passed over. I was passed over. You don't know what that's like. You don't know what that feels like to express the chip on his shoulder and everything that's going on. And then later when Michael does come out the way he hugs him because he feels so bad about what happened to his brother. And then he gets whacked anyway because Michael's just so heartless. He's got nothing left. He can't help it. John Cazale is so amazing. And he he unfortunately died at in 1978. He was only 40, 42 years old or something like that. He was in five feature-length movies. Five. He was in The Godfather, The Godfather 2, The Conversation, Dog Day Afternoon, and The Deer Hunter. Three of those movies won Best Picture. The other two were nominated. And The Conversation couldn't win because it was up against The Godfather Part 2. It's absurd. His repertoire is unmatched <laughs> like there is nobody who has been in a more perfect set of movies in the history of time than john cazal he never made a bad one he made five that were nominated for best picture three that won best picture and the deer hunter is my number one movie the godfather i have at 17 and the godfather part two i have at 77 which is probably way too low it's crazy what that man was able to accomplish in a very short acting career that was between 1972 and 1978 that was only when he was in movies so finally had his break he was engaged to meryl streep and then he died uh way too young but all of that being said he gets overlooked fredo in general gets overlooked fredo's character is so deep there's so mm -hmm. much to fredo's character it is such an enticing character and a show. I, he just wanted to be something. He can't even control the woman who's out there dancing with the other girl. In the first movie, he hits the woman in the face. He's trying to get in with Mo Green. Now he's trying to – he always wanted to be something he wasn't because he never felt appreciated for who he was. Mm -hmm. It's devastating. And it ultimately, finally, he feels like he found a way to become himself and he ends up getting killed. And you know what? Michael feels awful about the fact that he did it. Can't believe he did it. He's disgusted with himself. He's disgusted with all of it. But it was business. It was nothing personal. It was strictly business. And that was Michael's motto for the entire Godfather Part Two. Yep. So, John Cazale. Everybody go watch John Cazale movies. 
That's it. That's what I got. John, you got anything else on the Godfather part two or should we wrap this? No, we let's, wrap this uh, let's wrap it up. All right. So next week we're moving on to our number 76 where neither John or I will talk about our 76th favorite movie of all time. This is the first time. I think this happens three times. Let me look real quick. One, two. It only happens twice. So this is one of two times where we both have the movie that we have listed higher up. So John has Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. I have it way higher. I have Children of Men. He has it way higher. So we can't talk about either of them. So instead, we're going to talk about Columbus from 2017, which is John's movie. And then we're going to talk about District 9 from 2009, which is my movie. Neither one of these movies are in our top 100, but it's what's filling in here at the quarter mark as we roll our way through uh, this. This will be our 25th episode, which is pretty unreal to think about. And then we get back into it, and we actually talk about the week after that. We talk about Return of the King, which is the first Lord of the Rings we're talking about and the first movie we're talking about that I had on my list, but we couldn't talk about because John had it higher. So the first movie we're talking about that we'll both have had on our list, but we're mm -hmm. talking about uh, – no, this, this will be the first movie we're talking about that we both had on our list. So that's exciting. Yep. Um so get ready for that. That's in two weeks, though. So this week it will be Columbus from 2017 and District 9 from 2009, replacing Children of Men and Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Hope you all enjoyed this. Uh, Godfather Part 2, Eastern Promises, both worth a look, uh, definitely. Um, and yeah, that's it. Uh, I'm P Wood 43 on Letterbox. He's Jay Millsip. We've been watching a bunch of stuff. I went from Paddington 2 to an Ingvar Bergman movie last night. It happens. It is what it is. You never know what you're going to get. Uh, so make sure to follow us over there if you're into our movie, uh, our movie takes, and you just want to see what we're watching because maybe you'll want to watch it too. Uh, otherwise, there's a there's a Survivor uh, Game Show Network thing that's premiering in 48 minutes. So if you're watching this and you're in the Survivor Game Show Network, watch that. That'll be on our channel. And uh, John and I will be back next Monday with uh, with the 25th episode in the series. The 25th, John, is about to be the longest running series in the history of the Specialist Podcast. So get ready. Um, 25 episodes, pretty unreal. Thanks everybody for listening. See.